Good morning, everyone. Uh, looks like there's collective experience in the room. So uh, what, what I'd suggest is as I'll go through this presentation, if you've got questions, just uh, let's uh, throw your hand in the air and ask them as we go. Um, what, what I'm hoping to do in the next 20 minutes or so is just give you a brief snapshot of the world uh, supply and demand situation, particularly around beef, uh, but also to help you understand other proteins in the marketplace and the place they pl play and uh, also give you a view on the sort of dynamics of uh, what's going on in the domestic market. So, as I said, uh, please do not hesitate to ask me along the way any questions you may have. Uh, so, as I said, it's a beef market update, but it does have the theme of other proteins within it. So it's been a great couple of years for beef producers. Uh, beef production in Australia has taken advantage of some opportunities in the marketplace in recent years. Um, what you can see there is effectively uh, you, you see we've, we've taken the ability to meet market demands and in 2014 there was about 10 million head of cattle killed. That, that was the highest slaughter level that Australia had seen in the previous 20 years. Um, can anyone think of what was happening seasonally in 2014? Was it much different to now? A bit of rain, it was a bit dry, yeah? Yeah, dry, so people were turning cattle off. It was a good time though, because at that point in time, there was plenty of export market opportunity. So of the 10, 10 million head of cattle killed at this period here, uh, about three, three mil were younger cattle, but there was a lot of older cattle processed in that period. Turn the clock forward to uh, 2016, there's about seven, just over seven million head of cattle killed in Australia. That was our lowest slaughter level in 20 years. So within two years, we've gone from the highest slaughter level to the lowest slaughter level. And the driver behind the drop in slaughter level was people had basically got rid of a lot of their older cows. Um, they'd taken a, an approach to herd rebuilding. Uh, seasonally, uh, seasons picked up in this period here. And uh, so some people were trying to, uh, you know, hold cattle and, and, and grow their, their breeding base again. So does that resonate with some of the actions that people in this room may have taken at that point in time? Yeah. So the critical thing there is, you remember those timings of uh, when we were saying slaughter peaked and then slaughter reduced. So basically when slaughter peaked, we were turning cattle off um, and we were turning them off en masse and you think about where we are in the market and supply and demand, there hasn't been as many cattle in the marketplace, so to speak. Anyone want to hazard a guess as to what a typical marketplace looks like? If I said you went to SR yards at any particular place, the sort of percentage of buyers in the market from the different categories being processors, feedlotters and restockers. Anyone hazard a guess as to what a typical market looks like? About 30% of your market will be processors on any given day. Probably 30% will be feedlotters on most given days. Um, and what's driven the price side of things in recent times has been restockers. So people, you know, either buying in cattle to grow out or uh, chasing those young sort of wiener cattle or buying cows. So restockers in the last uh, sort of 18 months or so have been driving that market and that price. So. You know, nothing like price to motivate people to buy cattle to achieve a margin. So it's a bit, it's the gift that keeps on giving. So what's happened is people like the feedlotters who typically would go into a marketplace and buy cattle have had to, you know, they've had to compete a bit harder. They've tended to trouble, in most cases, buy cattle are a little bit lighter, keep them on feed for a little bit longer. So the thing that's worked in their favour from a feedlotter's perspective is grain prices have been reasonably cheap. So you've got to remember the, the position that they are in the market. So the market softened a little bit in recent uh, times, or well, I had a little kick up last week, but recent times it softened. What do you think's driving that? Season. Season. So it's got a bit dry, so all those restockers that were buoyant and positive uh, have probably gone into their shell a little bit and there's just not that competition from the producer level. Um, the other thing it's just important to remember here is in the last little period, uh, slaughter weights have increased. A anyone like to hazard a guess as to why that's the case? 
holding stock, so you're holding them a bit longer, trying to get a bit more at $6 a kilo. Yeah. Anything else? They're not as um, uh, overstocked. Uh, yeah, they're probably the season was running with them, so correct, they were putting a bit more weight on. Uh, it's a little bit of a play by the feedlotters too. So they're holding cattle on feed a bit longer because they didn't have a heap of cattle to put in behind them. Normally they'd turn them off, but they'll hang on to them a bit more. So that's important to remember because if we look at cattle on feed, is you know cattle on feed a big concern? Do you see that influence in this area, cattle on feed? What sort of cattle would the majority of uh, this room be producing at this point in time? Grass fed. Grass fed, yeah. So I'm from Tamworth. If you get up in that part of the world or even from Scone, there's a lot of people pretty much focused on feeder cattle. Um, so what you see is the feedlots have been growing, sorry, wrong way. Feedlots have been growing their cattle on feed year on year for about the last five years. And at this point in time, there's about 1.1 million cattle on feed. So if you think about how many cattle we kill in a year, which is about that sort of seven mil, and feedlotters typically have got about a million head of cattle on at the moment, and they're typically doing a short feed, how many times might those feedlots turn their cattle over in a year? A couple of times, two or three times? Yeah, so, Consistency of supply of product from a feedlot situation is quite important in our market. But interestingly, the comment was grass-fed. There's a big interest in grass-fed beef again, which is refreshing. And uh, recently I was at a presentation where um, uh, the Tees Cargill uh, group were talking about the growth in their markets. And particularly the market that's strongest growing for them is grass-fed beef into the US because the US market typically grain fed, they actually want something different. So it's horses for courses, but it's important to understand feedlotters, the scale of feedlotters and the effect that they have on buying cattle, but underpin that with grain price. So the last couple of years grain's been re relatively cheap. This year, some of, uh, some of my customers will be harvesting grain probably the end of this week. Um, the expectation is grain price is going to significantly jump up. So all of a sudden the margin in the feedlot game is going to get significantly tight. And an example of that was um, a week ago, just over a week ago, the, the Merriwar Show had a heap of cattle on feed for the Merriwar Show. Um, they killed all of those cattle. I think the whole margin in the feedlotting exercise across the whole group of cattle was less than $70 a head. So there's not a lot of margin in there. So you've just got to remember that that any change in grain input price or cattle input price is, is really quite, it does change the feedlot game significantly. Any questions on, on that, on feedlots? Because I'll pretty much park. So the US market. So if we think about, um, you know, our supply. So this period, uh, this period here, when we had those really big slaughter levels, the reason we uh, succeeded was that the US market increased their import of Australian beef. If the US market hadn't been going through their herd rebuilding, they would have had more beef themselves and wouldn't want it ours, but it was a bit of a perfect storm. So, you know, that 14, 15 period, we filled a void and uh, we made good money um, and we, we met the market need. So the US herd's rebuilding right now has been rebuilding for a few years. So anyone in the room want to hazard a guess at how many cows are in the US at the moment? Go on, just have a crack. 20 million. 20 million, we'll, we'll go a bit higher. So there's about 28 million breeding cows in the US at the moment. Um, our US Protein specialist Don Close just released a report about three weeks ago suggesting that the US herd will continue to build until about 32 million cows, 32, 32 and a half million cows, which is about 70 million head if you think they've all got offspring. So at that point in time, they think that will stabilise the market and they'll be back to a supply and demand, a bit of an equality. So price in the US will, will come off. 
So they expect that that process may take another two years, out to 2019. So if the US cow herd peaks in 2019, when logically would be the point in time where they get potentially an increased supply? 18 months after it, yeah, something like that, about 2021. So if you said, you know, you're crystal balling and said, I'm in beef production, what does it look like? It doesn't look too bad for the next probably four or five years. And relatively speaking, it's pretty good compared with where it's been for the last 10 years. So the average price for the last 10 years of trade cattle in New South Wales has been, anyone want to hazard a guess that? About $2.28 a kilogram. So would anyone sell cattle at the moment for $2.28 a kilogram? No, you're way off the market, but the perspective is in the last 10 years, that's where it's been. So all I can say to you is the m demand will be there, but a little bit of softening in price is also uh, coming through and, and you're seeing that. You, you're seeing that in terms of processes backing the pace off a little bit and feedlotters as, as their supply and demand and their margin gets squeezed, they will as well. So what's happening a little bit in the US at the moment is um, the percentage of beef that's actually meeting choice and prime grading, so the top end grading, has increased. So they're getting better at grading them uh, to a higher level. So what you're going to see is the US be a little bit more competitive on prime quality meats into Asia. That's where we may come under the most pressure, yeah? because they will, they will try and pip us into that market. Um, like everything, that'll be a price situation, but we should still be competitive, but the US will push that way. Is China going to keep increasing or stabilise? In terms of their requirements, yeah. uh, there's a lot of people in China, you've all heard that message, uh, lots and lots and lots. They will keep increasing as their, as their income increases and their desire for protein increases. You've got to remember though, from a Chinese perspective, the traditionally not really big beef eaters, they, uh, they do enjoy a lot of pork and chicken. Um, China will buy lots of product at a price and, and I'll, we're just about to get to the Chinese market because that, that's an important market for us as well. Um, in terms of seasonal factors, we talked through that a little bit. So, you know, it's really as drought uh, commences, um, demand for that US beef that I talked to before increased. We got heavy rain in Australia. So, you know, what you're going through, most other people are going through. And as you drive around the state, it's pretty dry in most places. And um, you, you, you've got to be very careful talking about where the rain fell and didn't fall, um, because, it, you know, it's a fine line. You know, I was, there was some isolated places on the Liverpool Plains got 70, 80 mils. Um, and places, you know, two or three k's down the road got 10 last week. So you've you, you got to be, but, but in terms of feed base, there's, there's not a lot of feed base anywhere. So it's how you think about taking cattle through and there's other speakers today which will talk more on that. So record prices, I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. Um, this graph is uh, a comparison of, uh, um, so top line Canada, uh, second line being, um, uh, being the US. Um, the point there is that in July, sort of this July period in 2016, all converted back to US dollars per kilo, Australia had the dearest cattle or dearest beef in the world. So um, supply and demand. So, you know, you think, you know, I talked about the US rebuilding, I talked about the seasonality that we were having. Um, we've taken advantage of being in the right place at the right time. That advantage has meant, and this is a busy slide, but the margin, the margin between um, uh, US cow input price, 90 CL, that's a jargon term, but effectively that's quite lean, uh, that's lean mints. Um, the margin between that and the actual cow price has squeezed up considerably. And so you, that's why you'll see processes and the desire to keep plants operating start to wane because there's a limit as to how much money um, they will want to waste. You know, a couple of years ago, they were making good margin, as you can see, 
uh, but that's, that's why they will wind it back and they'll be running their plants to cover their labour and that's about it. So you've seen a little bit of preferentiality in terms of plants and uh, a bit of a wait list in some cases to kill cattle over recent times. Where to for prices? So um, that's, that's a competitor in the domestic market, so that's lambs. There's your cattle price over the top of it. Your goat price, not that that should be driving many people in the room. Um, and the reference there being uh, pigs. So you've got to remember that as prices go up and su supply and demand do what they do, there are other sources in the market of protein for people, specifically in Asia or in other places. Um, we, you, you think of demand in big increments, but the US market, for, exist, for instance, the US has been going through a little bit lately of uh, what you might call a tougher period of time economically. So consumption of protein, whether that be pork, chicken or beef, has dropped. So on average, the average American, at, as at this year, is eating 88 kilos of protein, of which about 25 kilos of that is beef per annum. They expect, as things improve slowly in the US, that that consumption will go to 90 kilos. Doesn't sound like much, but all of a sudden an extra two kilos off across a lot of Americans can consume a lot of product internally. So, you know, we don't need rapid changes in the way people eat, they're subtle changes. And you've got to remember that some of these production systems like pork and chicken can be quite controlled, uh, can be very controlled in terms of outputs. So anyone in the room had anything to do with chickens? No? You like eating them. Like eating them. Righto. So for those of you that uh, might go to KFC, and, and I'd suggest some of you are looking at me saying, I think he's in that build. Um, how old do you think the average uh, chicken is that you might consume at one of those places? How long? Six weeks? Yeah, sort of 32 to 35 days. Yep. So the sort of average chicken that you might get as a barbecued chicken or a sort of family roast chicken that you might cook at home? Ten weeks. Yeah, you're probably looking at about 45 days. Yeah. Uh, and the big pieces, you know, the big Marylands and things that you get that are relatively cheap? 50, 55 days. So the average chicken production processing unit will turn over a chicken shed every 57 days. What are they feeding them? Um, so it's a lot about genetics. They actually have slowed genetics down because the genetics were growing too quick for the physical. Um, but it's, it's a lot about genetics and a lot about feed. But you think about those scenarios, they can be really quite measured about outputs. So, you know, there's a processor in uh, Tamworth at the moment that's killing two and a half million chickens a week. You know, they want to go to about four million chickens a week. So there's an insatiable appetite for protein that's cheap. And at the end of the day, as cattle producers, you are in a protein market. So, you know, you think about where it is your product's going and how it's competing. This is a perspective on the world. So we talked about the Australian beef cattle herd being around that 26 million mark. Um, somewhere there, thereabouts. Uh, the perspective is, uh, in terms of cattle, India's about the 300 million mark. Is that surprising? No, a lot of buffalo probably goes into Asia under uh, other labels in what they call the grey trade. Um, this is the power that you, um, that you hear a bit about over recent times, Brazil. And the interesting thing about Brazil is sort of like that 200 and, uh, 240,000 head, something thereabouts, uh, 240 million head, beg your pardon. The, the key is there, you think of their production increase between 2010 and 2016 is about the same population as the whole cattle herd in Australia. Now, the good thing for us is the production system in Brazil is very different to ours and processing and logistics is very different to ours and producers uh, actually don't get rewarded for carcass weight over there. It's just per animal. 
and their systems mean that they can't compete in all markets in the world, but they can compete as, compete as a commodity product. So they're very good at that because there's lots of them. So that commodity or commoditization of their product means that they can go into markets. So same with Brazil, you think about where meat's going, those bigger powerhouse businesses can put commodity, cheaper product into markets that we may have gone in, like China, or uh, you know, um, a lot of the European style countries. Probably the only thing that's playing over the top of that at the moment is currency values. So with a fair bit going on in, Asia, in Europe around currencies, you can see volumes in the countries up and down depending on the value of their dollar. And I haven't even talked about the Australian dollar yet and the impact it has on our beef. The key for countries like Brazil is um, they're very good at uh, coming into a marketplace. So this is, um, this is the Chinese market, tonnage of meat. And Brazil kicked off in that sort of July 15 period and grew dramatically. Um, effectively, they grew dramatically uh, at a time when we were sort of chipping into that market as well. So we've just got to be mindful of how they play in the market. Now, can anyone remember earlier in the year, I think it was about April, what happened uh, in China, or more importantly, what happened in Brazil? Yeah, so there was, there's about, so our expert over there, Adolfo, there's about 4,000 processing plants. Um, of which five had an issue around um, meat inspection. And that five then created a problem because the Chinese market just banned Brazilian product. And there's all this Brazilian product was on the water and it couldn't go into China anymore. And they were banned from that market for two weeks. So all of a sudden there's a furor. So, you know, if you think about why it is we do what we do and the quality product we produce and the sustainability and trace back and all of the things that at times you find uh, all encompassing, it's, it's all about that market access. So, you know, Brazil will be in there chipping away. The thing about these commodity style countries is price. So, you know, average import prices over this period of time dropped by 13%, largely because of commodity product out of Brazil at a cheap price. Uh, a busy slide, but to say that when we talked about Brazil being big, but they just can't quite get it together. Um, a very big focus in the Brazilian market at the moment is crossbreeding, um, actually driving some growth in genetics. A lot of cattle there, so they don't have to increase much to actually get their supply curve together. And uh, pasture development, um, new thoughts, not for many people in this room, but in Brazil, very new thoughts. Uh, and that US beef herd that I talked about sort of peaking in about 2019. Um, if we think about Asia, strong pork production, strong desire for chicken, so it'll underpin it. It's a good market, but you know, we just can't simply say everything will go to China or everything will go to Japan. So in terms of sort of finishing up about what's driving the growth in animal proteins, because in effect that's what you're in the market of, you're, you're producing protein, trade, it's more complex, it's a lot more political, things can upset that apple cart. You're thinking about, uh, for instance, Brexit and, and how England fares into Europe, how we fare into Asia. People are starting to draw lines and say, what does our trade look like and can we get into these markets? Margin shifts, so I talked about the margin shift, particularly in a processing point of view and from a feedlotting point of view. So with grain prices going up this year, the margin on feedlotters is going to be quite tight, so you might see their activity wane a little bit. Value adding, so thinking about what markets we go into with a more quality based cut and a quality based product, which um, I'm sure you're all very aware of, and, and giving basically you've got a grass fed product domestically or internationally, you're well positioned in this location. Changing production models in terms of complexity, so that's thinking about um, how different markets or different countries get to market and do things that improve their performance as opposed to what we do in Australia. And, and lastly, alternative proteins, so that chicken and pork and consumption. So it's to give you a view because sometimes it's hard to get that view as to what's actually happening in the marketplace. Now, remember all the things I've talked about 
And I didn't talk about the dollar going up and down, which has a very big impact because as soon as we start exporting, our competitive nature is very much based on our dollar.